Hey everyone, welcome to Neighbor Science, the only podcast about political economy and young neocon not watching anime. I'm Ryan <laughs> Salisbury, and today I have returning guest, young neocon. How you doing? So we are returning to the Seeing Like a State uh, book series. We're up to chapter 7, and uh, this chapter is on compulsory villagization in Tanzania. And you may not know what the hell uh, villagization is, so we're, uh, we're going to get into that. I didn't know what it was until I read the book, so... Yeah, same. And he mentions it earlier. I, I did, uh, if you've been listening to the whole series, he mentions villagization in Vietnam uh, earlier in the book. And so I did look it up. Was he talking about the uh, American campaign or, like, the Vietnamese state? Um, well, what I found was, like, it was, a, like, a joint effort between the American and uh, South Vietnamese government. Mm-hmm. Well, because you know, there's a, there's like that. Uh, there's also a separate story involving uh, it's very James Scott in uh, in flavor involving um, indigenous uh, special forces. So like uh, America recruited uh, troops from people living in like upland mountainous Vietnam who didn't want to live under North or South Vietnam hmm. and recruited them as like special forces because they and they uh, they like switched sides like. Obviously, like twenty times, like both for and against America. It's pretty, actually, pretty. Like, uh, they're pretty cool. They're a great, like, sort of forgotten chapter of the Cold War. I think uh, it's one of those things because they fly in the face, sort of, of like both the ML narrative and the neo, like the liberal narrative. Because uh-huh. you know they 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 just wanted to, you know didn't want to be under the rule of any state whatsoever, and they were willing to make any flexible alliance to do that to assure that. So, in part of that, that meant it ending up like fighting with the U.S. Army, but then also fighting against it. It's pretty weird. So, sort of, sort of like a Vietnamese Green Army. Uh, yeah, I think so. It'd be a, is we, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a story. Uh, uh, I don't. I've never seen. It's like I've uh, seen very little like discussion of it historically. It's just like interesting. I don't know. Yeah, I definitely didn't find anything about that. Um. Yeah. So, so you know, anyway. anyway. Um, yeah, we're we're going to be talking about villagization in Tanzania. Basically, forced resettlement is is like the basic definition that we're talking about. Um, I wanted to give a little background um, because I obviously uh, didn't know anything about Tanzania before this, and I'm sure a lot of people don't either. Um, so, just like a, a basic historical background: um, modern day Tanzania was colonized by Germany in the late 19th century. The Society for German Colonization, uh, which was an organization meant to raise capital to found a colony in East Africa, uh, was formed, uh, you know, to uh, colonize Tanzania. They were seeking to keep up with other world-dominating empires. Uh, Gustav Schmoller, who was an economist of the Historical School of uh, Economics, felt that Germany should create a large navy for imperial expansion, um, probably basically uh, copying Britain. Uh, Germany's advanced industry also left them in danger of a general glut, which was the top fear of other European imperial powers. So an African colony would be a place where both natural resources and buyers of manufactured goods could be found. Um, this was also a major motive for colonization by Britain and was like uh, the focus of a lot of early political economy was like fe- the fear of general glut and um, colonization as a way to stave that off. Um, so the society was formed into the German East Africa company, uh, which is confusing because there's also a German East African company. Um, and they ran mines, produced coffee and rubber and built railroads. Um, (laughs) and I put a uh, segue into young neocons, big, big rant on trains. If you want to get into that real quick. (laughs) <laughs> uh, uh, I, I don't have a big rant on trains. I just uh, I was just reading a I was just reading a book on the formation of the modern state and notion of territory, and it was talking. It was summarizing. Here he goes. A, okay. A long, it, was, it was just summarizing a long list of work that showed how basically the very idea of like front of the frontier and of territory and like a contiguous, uh, a coherent, economically unified state required the existence of railroads. And I posted about this, and everybody got furious. All right, so you hate you hate trains and you love cars. We get it. Exactly. That's right. That's my, that's my position. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, after World War I, the Tanzanian part of German East Africa, which was at that time called Tanganyika, 
hopefully I pronounced that correctly because it's going to come up a couple more times, uh, was transferred to Britain by mandate of the League of Nations. One of the major projects of British colonial rulers was the eradication of the tsetse fly, which is the primary carrier of sleeping sickness. Um, and I looked into that, and the reason that the tsetse fly was even there to begin with was actually a consequence of colonization as well. Um, the habitat is is thorny shrubs, which were few in East Africa because they have uh, grazing animals that kept the ground as pasture. But then uh, Italians came in uh, and uh, imported a bunch of cows from another place and caused an outbreak of rinderpest that wiped out the entire herd of the region. But but the TT fly came from elsewhere in Africa, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason it was in that area, I meant. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought it might be one of the greater ecological disasters in history because it has prevented the reintroduction of grazing animals in many areas since then. Um, some scholars have constructed a tsetse suitability index and found that increased levels were associated with slower development of agriculture and urbanization. Um, and, oh, and I put a comment that said, okay, I guess that would have also been ecologically disastrous. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, that, that, that sounds like some James Scott shit right there, so... <laughs> Another British project uh, of the time was a high modernist, massive industrial grain factory project. They tried to plant 50,000 acres of farm on the Ardai Plains, 25,000 acres on Kilimanjaro. And then it just failed. <laughs> yeah, 25,000 near Morongoro. So, you know, I don't want to go too long on this, but uh, I'll skip to the other details. In 1954, Julius Nerere, uh, a Tanganyikan school teacher started a socialist national liberation party. I pulled this from Wikipedia and it skips everything from that to uh, the next part. In December 1961, uh, Tanganyika became an independent Commonwealth country with Nyerere as prime minister, but retaining the British queen. Uh, two years and one day later, Zanzibar, which is uh, an island near uh, Tanganyika. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's semi independent, it's Muslim. Primarily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they became independent with a sultan as the head of state. Uh, the sultanate created a plantation economy based on clove production with African slaves supporting their lavish lifestyle. And just over a month after that, the African majority resulted, uh, revolted against the sultan and formed yet another new government with the Marxist-Leninist Afro-Shirazi Party, or ASP as its ruling party. And so finally, in April 1964... Tanganyika and Zanzibar were united and named the United Republic of Tanzania, which is a portmanteau of the two country names. Well, I actually didn't know that. That's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't either. So, um, okay. So now we can get to the actual chapter. Uh, so Scott is going to talk about the Ujamaa village campaign, which ran from 1973 to 1976. Sorry. There's a cute kitty outside, uh, which was a countrywide forced resettlement campaign. Um, or it's forced settlement, I should say. Um, so the reasons he gives for focusing on this are, one, it was, by most accounts, the largest forced resettlement scheme undertaken in independent Africa up to that time. At least 5 million Tanzanians were, re were relocated. Two, the records of the project are abundant due to international interest and national transparency. And three, the project was intended to be positive rather than retributive, oppressive, militaristic, or genocidal. Um, Scott says that in comparison to Soviet collectivization, the campaign was a case of large-scale social engineering by a relatively benign and weak state. Or an attempt at it. Yes. Yeah. So he says uh, many other large-scale resettlement schemes can be subjected to much the same analysis if, in the Tanzanian case, Chinese and Russian models, as well as Marxist-Leninist rhetoric, play an important ideological role, we should not imagine that these were the only sources of inspiration for such schemes. We could as easily have examined the huge forced removals under apartheid policies in South Africa, which were far more brutal and economically destructive. We could also have analyzed any number of the many large-scale capitalist schemes for production, often requiring substantial population movements that have been undertaken with international assistance in poor countries. Julius Nerere, Tanzania's head of state, viewed the permanent resettlement in ways that were strikingly continuous with colonial policy, as we shall see, and his ideas about both mechanization and economies of scale in agriculture were part and parcel of international development discourse at the time. 
That discourse of modernization was in turn heavily influenced by the model of the Tennessee Valley Authority, the development of capital-intensive agriculture in the United States, and the lessons of economic mobilization from World War II. And so Nyerere specifically wanted to avoid administrative or military coercion, but that sort of ended up happening anyway. And further, it was ecologically and economically a failure. So in short, Scott chose this example because theoretically it would have been good, but it wasn't. Right. It had, every, it had everything going for it at the same time. Uh, noble, noble ends, uh, a weak, like a benign, relatively benign state, the consensus of international discourse, the, the unity of uh, both sort of like uh, I- international development, but also like socialist uh, party politics, you know, so like. Uh, yeah, like I listened to I listened to this uh, podcast on this. Um, I can't remember the name of it now because it was it was uh, about a month ago, but um, they they basically like sort of saw Julius Nerere as just like he was a good uh, good leader and didn't really have any major issues except like he was sort of a patriarch at home. <laughs> uh, it seems like the criticisms of this scheme are like very technical and um, academic for the most part, and not like part of the like popular narrative about Tanzania. Well, remember who writes that narrative though. That's another James mm-hmm. Scott point, right? It's not yeah. like people who are, it's not like the populations that are likely to be villagized are also the ones who have access to like uh, the need like journalism and discourse and academia and so on and political ideology. <laughs> like me, me, you know what I'm saying? Right? Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. The projects you hear about the most in history that pissed people, like, uh, they either have to be, like, very, very bad and everybody saw them, or they have to be done by someone who, like, lost a war, or they have to be, uh, like, the made victims have to be people who are, like, high in cultural capital, and then they'll write the narrative. Those are, like, those are, like, the main atrocities you'll hear about. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, the first, like, uh, subhead is called Colonial High Modernist Agriculture in East Africa. So Scott talks briefly of the elaborate and massive post-war British colonial projects, which regularly involved conscription of 30,000 laborers to work on plantations, strictly regimented soil schemes, soil conservation schemes, sorry, and forced resettlements. The widespread unpopularity of these projects may have partly explained the popularity of TANU, which I don't think I said is the party that Nyerere started. It's the Tanzanian African National Union. So if I say TANU, that's what I'm talking about. So the colonial policies explain the popularity of TANU in rural Tanzania. The forced conservation and livestock programs were particularly unpopular. However, Scott says what is most striking is the degree to which the assumptions of the colonial regime match those of the independent and far more legitimate socialist state of Tanzania. So the assumptions which are starting to sound familiar if you've been following the uh, whole series are based on a complete faith in what officials took for scientific agriculture on one hand and a nearly total skepticism about the actual agricultural practices of Africans on the other. A provincial agricultural official in uh, Chiri Valley was quoted as saying, the African has neither the training, skill, nor equipment to diagnose his soil erosion troubles, nor can he plan the remedial measures, which are based on scientific knowledge, and this is where I think we rightly come in. <laughs> Those are always the uh, yeah the worst words you want to hear, right? Like right. <laughs> not not to uh, inadvertently quote perhaps one of the worst statist uh, villains in history, but the worst thing to hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, ironically said, ironically said by again one of the worst uh, monstrous <laughs> uh, statist villains in history. But anyway, right, right. So I was interested to see exactly who this official was uh, and tried to track down the source, but I wasn't able to. Um, William Beinart Beinart quoted it in Agricultural Planning and the Late Colonial Technical Imagination via Langworthy in Malawi, an Alternative Pattern of Development. Um, So I, I tried finding those titles on all of my normal piracy sites. Um, and it seems like the, Langworthy thing was like a seminar at the University of Edinburgh with minutes that were recorded but are only available at the University of Edinburgh Library. Um, and I tried to do like an exact text match search on this 
like parts of this quote, and the only thing that came up was from this book. So yeah, unless you have access to an academic library, it's really hard to track this stuff down. Yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, and basically what what I was curious about is whether this official was a newly appointed Black Tanzanian or a carryover from either the Zanzibar Sultanate or colonial British rule. If it was at the University of Edinburgh, I mean, chances are it was <laughs> some sort of foreign advisor. Right, yeah. Yeah, because if I recall correctly, like a lot of the um, like mid-level bureaucrats in the Soviet Union were carryovers from the Tsar government. For the first like uh, transitionary period of the Soviet Union. Okay. I actually, I have a really a set of articles on this. Uh, you don't the like uh, I did a thread of the stuff, stuff like uh, about like Soviet legal system, uh, dip, uh, diplomatic corps, uh, economic advisors. Uh, their like equivalent of like their military corps, like all the professional corps and classes and bureaucrats were carried over from the Tsar's regime. But then they had like a transitional period of like. Where they they got tried to get rid of them as quickly as possible, but it still took like twenty years. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you can find that thread again, I'll link it in the show description. Yeah, because they needed they needed the expertise, right? So they couldn't yeah. too quickly get rid of them, but at the same time they were trying to get rid of them so they didn't so they had a loyal core. So this ended up with like a kind of interesting thing where like for the first 10, 15 years of the Soviet Union, it's just all Tsarists, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, there's just like a totally new core of people. Makes sense. Because uh, they all because all the other people get purged and like a totally new class of people gets like whatever. But then people who were even trained by the first class of like the charists were not really trusted either. So then after like Stalin falls, like that group gets like reinstalled. I don't know. So like, there's, like, there's like these uh, waves of it. Anyway, interesting. Okay, so according to uh, Beinart, do you know how to pronounce that guy's name? Is it Beinart? It's, it's either Beinart or Boehner. Yeah. So. One of those two. <laughs> According to that guy, the Shire Valley Project was intended to be a model and attempt to replicate the Tennessee Valley Authority, including damming the local river and plans for heavy industry. Uh, there was even a model of what the vision for the Shire Valley Project would look like upon completion, like a like a physical model, that is. Um, but the Shire Valley plans failed almost completely in ways that will mirror the Ujamaa villages. The primary cause of the failure was simply the resistance of the would-be participants to adopt the new practices prescribed to them. So the resistance of the locals was vindicated by later studies. The erosion control methods widely used in uh, temperate clay slash silt slash peat soils were far worse than those already in use for the sandy soil of Shire Valley. Uh, So they caused gullies during the rainy season and overly quick drying after the rainy season, which encouraged white ants to eat the roots of the crops. Um, and the regimentation of government-supported settlement plots was so unappealing that it had to change to Plan B, which was government-run corn farms using wage labor. Um, but to their credit, the government later admitted fault for all this and said it was a bad idea. <laughs> for the Shire Valley Project, they also assumed away all of the different ecological zones, as well as any variation in the needs of the would-be settled people. Um, so they basically like created one... like plan of uh, like one set of crops for every person like no one had a different family size no one had you know were better or worse at growing certain things or any of that stuff they just uh, made it made it all uniform for everyone however the non-settled cultivators already had large toolkits of different planting methods that changed depending on the climate weather and location the planners assumptions however even ignored basic variations such as family size occupation and culture and like in every other modernist scheme, the potential settled subjects ended up creating informal settlements around the formal one, uh, for which they were labeled squatters. <laughs> and then be regularly cleared out by state forces. Mm-hmm. I have a section on uh, Unilever, like the soap company, um, but it's very long and overly complicated, and it's mainly about like the merger history of them. So if you're interested in that... Um, I thought it was interesting, uh, but then when I mentioned it to my girlfriend, she rolled her eyes and said, why are you reading about that? <laughs> uh, well, I think it's interesting, but yeah, I mean, they, they it's the everything company. Unilever makes everything. Yeah. Yeah, so basically they started a palm oil plantation in, in Africa, and to get there, they 
went through all this crazy shit. So if you're interested, uh, it's in the show notes. You can read it. Um, but I'm going to skip over it for for here. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to go straight to villages and improved farming in Tanzania before 1973. So at the time of independence, an estimated 11 million out of 12 million rural people lived scattered across the landscape. Most of the population, with the exception of tea and coffee producers, practiced subsistence farming or pastoralism. If they sold anything, it was informal and untaxable. So one of the major goals of the colonial project was to create a larger agricultural surplus that could be appropriated and exported to Europe. Scott then compares this back to the post-colonial project, um, where he says that even though the you know Tanyu regime was obviously much more legitimate, um, their policies had basically the same aim of yeah capturing the Ex- export-led growth. Yes, through uh, yeah. Through yeah, through through uh, highly controllable, uh, legible, regular primary product crops that can be produced with regularity against the seasons in fixed amounts and shipped to Europe and other export markets to earn foreign currency. Exactly. Yep. Which would which would then be used to buy more machinery and industry and so on. Yeah, that was the goal. Anyway, it's it's like that old meme: get a job so you can uh, have a car have a car so you can go to your job or whatever. Exactly. (laughs) So Scott has some quotes from Nyerere about, uh, from his inaugural address to show like what the purposes of villagization were. Um, So I'm going to quote directly here. He says, if you ask me why the government wants us to live in villages, the answer is just as simple. Unless we do, we shall not be able to provide ourselves with the things we need to develop our land and raise our standard of living. We shall not be able to use tractors. We shall not be able to provide schools for our, for our children. We shall not be able to build hospitals or have clean drinking water. It will be quite impossible to start small village industries, and instead we shall have to go on depending on the towns for all our requirements. And if we had a plentiful supply of electric power, we should never be able to connect it up to each isolated homestead. Which I think you would agree, Young, for a lot of those things, they are. They aren't just like intrinsically good. Like having tractors isn't intrinsically good, right? I mean, you have to ask tractors for what. Yeah, and like electricity for what? Even I mean, and clean drinking water for what? Who needs that? <laughs> okay, that's, See, that's the that's the you know. But right, like the the question for clean drinking water, right? It's a like, that's it's okay. See, that's actually a good example though, because the typical both liberal and ML sort of defense will be like, okay, but everybody knows clean drinking water is good, right? It's like, obviously everybody does that, right? But the point is, is that how do you get that to people in a way that doesn't destroy, like, you know, right? So, like, uh, mass centralized uh, water extracted from, like, rivers or flooded into, like, uh, reservoirs through uh, disruption of, like, rivers and other drainage systems and then filtered back out through a system might not be as efficient as, I don't know, like allowing people to just dig wells. Right. So that's like, and could cause later, like either draining of aquifers, which is a huge widespread global issue or water pollution and any other, yeah. And disrupt local hydrological cycles. It reshapes the shape, like the literal physical land. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah. So, uh, the question is not, even there and then also even for like electricity right it's like the same thing i i mean we all want presumably electricity right but like you need electricity to play video games yes right <laughs> do you want do you want to be like kicked out do you want to be like kicked out of your homeland and then like forced to work in like a factory uh under like toiling conditions to get electricity to like for like i don't know uh, to, to cook food on a stove that gets you less nutritious food than before i don't know you know what i mean like there's always a yeah like the signifiers of development that they use are often themselves like not bad. It's just like, you have to ask for what, like, well, how are they getting there? And like, for what ends, like, are they doing development for the sake of um, people? Or are they using people for the sake of development? It's really kind of the difference, I think. And can, can those systems be like isolated from the hole that they're coming from? Exactly. Like having a, you know, a, large centralized water filtration system doesn't sound like 
it would cause any problems in and of itself. But once you account for all of the infrastructure and industry that you need to produce and operate it, um, it starts to look not so good anymore compared to, like you said, just digging wells or something. Yeah. And and things that people already know how to do and then don't need to be like taught by the state how to do. Yes. Like, that's the other thing. Is that there's always this assumption of, like, oh, what do we do to achieve these ends, right? But it's, like, that itself is, betrays this sort of, like, statist outlook, right? That, that like, uh, mm-hmm. that there is a single solution for everything and that, like, people don't, like, people are passive actors that don't know how to do stuff and don't have knowledge and history and don't know their land and don't know, you know, uh, each other and don't know how to survive. You know what I mean? Like, in general, people do know those things Mm -hmm. you just have to enable them to do it give them the resources to do it and remove restrictions in their way but that those two things enabling people to do what they want and removing restrictions are the exact opposite of the tools that the state has so (laughs) right so the state instead has to think of everything in a very different way which is how do we manage people to do to achieve these ends and then that's why you know it's seeing like a state yeah, there was like a there was a thread you had fairly recently, might have been like a month or two ago, but um, where you were talking about how uh, everyone seems to assume that like if the state wasn't creating a food system, that people would just like starve to death, like nobody would figure out how to feed themselves. <laughs> yeah, that's not that's actually not my quote. That's from um, I think it's from uh, like Tikkun or Invisible Committee. It's just like uh, when in history has anybody just let themselves starve? It's basically the point. Mm-hmm. Which, but it's like true. I mean, right. <laughs> people, there has been mass starvation in history, but almost without fail, it is during a time when people were restricted in their access to what they were like trying to do. Right. Like either through a capitalist imperial state or through a development project or through forced villagization or through uh, orchestrated human ecological disaster. Like it's just, you know, yeah. Okay. In a uh, policy statement about the trajectory of Tanzania's development, Nyerere expressed concern that the country would, if it continued along its current path, develop a petty bourgeois kulak class that would subjugate their neighbors into wage labor and their society would become capitalist, which is ironic with the Shire Valley project having wage labor in it. But anyway, um, one of the goals of the Ujama villages was to avoid this by forming cooperative group villages. However, Nyerere's strategy was to make this gradual and, more importantly, voluntary. Um, he said, socialist communities cannot be established by compulsion only with willing members. Which I agree with. That's true. <laughs> um, however, after a few years of resistance, he started to shift on this and believed the peasants did not know what was good for them. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, right after the previous quote, he continues, it may be possible and sometimes necessary to insist on all farmers in a given area growing a certain acreage of a particular crop until they realize that this brings them a more secure living and then do not have to be forced to grow it. So you just force them a little bit until they realize that, you know, you know what's good for them and then they'll do it anyway. So many different villagization schemes were tried from all corners of society, but most were failures. Scott names three qualities that are especially important to understand the program. One, frequent and intense pilot schemes. Um, while it's obviously a good idea to try something first before rolling it out to everyone, they often absorbed huge amounts of capital, machinery, and personnel relative to their size. Scott says one influential scheme involving a mere 300 settlers managed to acquire four bulldozers, nine tractors, a field car, seven lorries, a maize mill, an electric generator, and a cadre of about 15 administrators and specialists, 150 laborers, and 12 artisans, which is very funny to me. So that would be a total of like 500 people, not just 300? Yeah, it's 300 settlers plus all those other workers that were sent to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah. It's almost it's almost a one to one or one to two ratio. Of, yeah. <laughs> of uh, yeah. Um. So due to the political history of Tanzania, the normal bureaucratic pathologies were exaggerated. The planners operated similarly to the American agronomists that we talked about earlier, designing Soviet farms in a Chicago hotel room. And three 
Nirere's directives against coercion were ignored in projects under bureaucratic pressure. The coercion mainly took the form of decree and rationing and the expulsion of statesmen that sided with resisting villagers. So there were some instances where, like, you know, an, an upper level bureaucrat would, you know, make some demand of a village and a lower level bureaucrat would be like, hey, uh, no, that's fucked up. We shouldn't do that. And uh, that bureaucrat would just get fired and replaced with someone who would be more obedient. It sounds like what they're saying is that, is that the, like the bureaucrats were pretty unified in what they wanted, but it would be like a politician on behalf of that area. Oh, yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Who had some sort of... Uh, uh, had some sort of um, extra bureaucratic legitimacy, but then they would be the 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 uh, elected officials became servants of the bureaucracy rather than the other way around. Yeah, yeah. So Scott clarifies that the villagization project was not simply about communal farm villages, as Nyerere said, but was uh, intended for centralization and management. To illustrate this, he talks about the Ruvuma Ruvuma Development Association (RDA) which is a federation of 15 villages formed by younger TA and U diehards before uh, even the 1967 declaration of this program. The villages created their own communal enterprises, and Nyerere declared one of the villages, Litoa, as an exemplar of rural socialism. Despite the praise, patronage, finance, and supposed local power given to these villages, they were ordered in 1967 to grow one acre of fire-cured tobacco per family. When they refused, TANU banned the RDA as an illegal organization. Its assets were seized, and it was absorbed by the TANU and state bureaucracy. Do you have any comments on that before I go to the next section? No. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, j- jump in anytime if you uh, want to make a comment while I'm reading. Okay, the next section is called To Live in Villages is in Order, and it's in quotes, so um, I think it's from a speech from Nyerere. Um, by 1974, Nyerere had given up all pretense of voluntary villagization and started Operation Planned Villages. Um, and that's like the actual name, not just me making a joke. Uh, Nyerere thought it was for everyone's own good to be forced into settlements because they were leading a life of death. Um, the strategy of the operation was educate the people, search for a suitable site, inspect the location, plan the village, demarcate the land clearly, train the officials in the methodology of Ujama, and resettlement. And Scott clarifies that educate was less of a helpful, persuasive instruction and more of a telling people what was going to happen and why. And the worst part is uh, planners were only given one day per village to create the plans, which is nuts. Yeah, that's absurd. Yeah. Um, part of the reason for the short time allotted was like part of the coercive tactic, uh, which, uh, was to rip the peasants away from their homes and put them into, in unfamiliar surroundings where they would be easier to control, which is like a third of, uh, Scott's later book against the grain toxic talking about forced resettlement as a way to control state subjects. Um, so the villagers uh, very rationally resisted being forced to completely change their way of life overnight. Um, their ways of life were the product of deep, long cultivated knowledge of the land ecosystem and climate. And the new ways of life that the bureaucrats had created were the product of aesthetic facsimiles of Euro-American society and administrative convenience. In a cycle that served each other. So like uh, mm-hmm. the aesthetic American Americanized fantasies serve bureaucratic convenience, and bureaucratic convenience makes aesthetic like superficial facsimiles more likely. Mm-hmm. So they they're reciprocally reinforcing these dynamics, right? The the cultural ideology of modernism and the colonial assumptions and the Eurocentric assumptions combined with the, stru- the material and social structures and information structures of bureaucracies are mutually reinforcing it, which I think is really important because it shows how it shows in a very important mechanism by which forms of sort of like a oppressive systems and their genesis can persist well past like i uh, like they can tra- they can be transplanted from one place to another absent sort of conscious uh desire or uh in even in express opposition to their mm-hmm. origins right so that's how you get all these like social stems and mls who propose things which would basically almost certainly end up 
creating a uh, form of like uh, like authoritarian modernism, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, I was just thinking, um, Scott Scott could easily fit uh, Elon Musk into large parts of this book. Um, I was watching a video a couple days ago about the loop system that system of tunnels underneath cities with like electric sleds for cars um you know basically like almost creating a train but without making a train right and how like uh he's getting all these politicians like signed on to the idea of creating this extremely stupid system um because it has like the aesthetic of um you know modernism or futurism or whatever you want to call it yeah like the yeah super futuristic whatever like even where le- any anything simpler would have just fulfilled the purpose better yeah and the video is going over all the different issues that the system would have beyond the like you know glistening facade of ooh you can solve traffic problems um such as it would be almost impossible to get all of the land rights to the like underground parts that you would want to put these tunnels in. Um, because apparently in, in common law, this is like the actual phrase they use. You have, if you own a piece of land, you own it from here to the center of the earth, heaven to hell or something like that. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, you'd have to like negotiate with, f- for, high traffic areas, increasingly larger numbers of people uh, who won't necessarily want to like perforate the ground with tunnels that could possibly have like exploding Teslas in them. <laughs> uh, this is a, uh, I think this is especially true in, in like California and the, and the Western States because the property laws um, preceded uh, the uh, actual formations of the States. Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, as such, like, common law and settler law and frontier law, like, basically define the property law of these areas. It's just why you literally, like, if you fly over them, you see that famous patchwork style over them. Because every other square acre of land is, like, allotted for a different purpose ahead of time. It's a, a very interesting thing. Um, but, like, on East Coast states, they don't have the problem. this problem. Uh, you don't necessarily own the mineral rights or the passage rights or the usage rights under your land or even, like, the water rights. And so, um, like, so sometimes you, it's like, if you find, and not that it really exists, but if you were to find oil on your land on the East coast, like you probably, there's a lot of places where you wouldn't even own it. You would just, you wouldn't even get the benefit of it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they like the local municipality could like just take it from you. But anyway, this is a side point. Anyway, <laughs> I guess that's why it was the Beverly hillbillies and not like the, uh, I don't know, New- Newark hillbillies. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, so let's see. Coercive tactic. Oh, facsimile of Euro-American society. Yeah. He actually brings this up quite a few times, um, in this chapter. And I think in other chapters where like, this was mostly an aesthetic thing. It had nothing to do with like empiricism or rationality or anything like that. Um, so anyway, uh, police were sent along to ensure that resettlements moved smoothly, often by burning or demolishing people's houses, <laughs> um, which sounds exactly like what cops would do. Um, Scott says that when the peasantry realized that open resistance was dangerous and probably futile, they saved what they could, often fleeing the new village at the first opportunity. Inducements were offered, uh, more so in the earlier stages, to go peacefully, including clinics, piped water, and schools. In wealthier, more densely populated areas, officials would simply designate existing villages as planned, which made sense uh, from their perspective since they had already achieved the goals of legibility and the production of surpluses. And the places just coincidentally were the most common places that the statesmen and bureaucrats lived. (laughs) So (laughs) Scott compares... Nyerere to Lenin in some ways. While he did not like hearing about people's homes being destroyed, that wasn't actually enough for him to stop the project. He was also insulated from hearing that kind of thing by uh, by uh, like effectively institutionalized kissassery. Yeah. So in both cases, mm-hmm. right? So 
and Stal and even more so Stalin than Lenin. Right. Uh, Stalin. Stalin famously. The problem with Stalin was that all the people who would tell him about the existence of problems he would not believe or trust, and all the people he would believe or trust wouldn't tell him about the existence of problems. <laughs> like so, yeah, that's a very famous uh, information problem for uh, well-meaning authoritarians. Well, you know, what else can you do? I, I think we can create a state where that isn't a problem. So yes, right. <laughs> Well, I'll have a super authoritarian who uh, tells the other authoritarians what to do, <laughs> and, and then there will be accountability. All we need is someone who is hyper rational with no biases of any kind and is eternally good. <laughs> and they can simpler, just so yeah, it's more efficient and guarantee sort of uh, that this person is reproduced. We can just have them have it be one family, and it'll be hereditary because <laughs> uh, you know the more rational people are going to raise, you know the children and it has to be global so because so they, so they can tell all the uh, locals what to do and so we'll have we'll have one hereditary uh family of rational um we can call them uh we can call them uh uh like leaders of the republic the people's monarch yeah no 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 they're no 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 they are the uh all right fine they're the monarch but uh uh, uh but uh, anyway and uh, they go, they'll govern the world uh, rationally, because that's what they do. Yeah. And uh, we'll be able to trust them. Why would they do it irrationally? That wouldn't make any sense. Exactly. Because <laughs> that's their job, to do it rationally. So yeah. that's what they'll do. And, you know, if you, don't, if you don't think that's a good idea, then that makes you an ultra-leftist liberal. Radlib. Yep. Radlib. Radlib. Anarchy. PMC. Radlib. <laughs> A uh, petty bourgeois uh, wrecker, yeah, Menshevik, right, Trotskyist. So anyway, uh, so Nyerere uh, didn't stop the project. He thought he knew better than the peasants and wanted the enlightened officials to lecture them into creating socialism, um, similar to Lenin. Uh, he also made comparisons to factories. Uh, here's a quote from him: He was fond of. Oh, not from him, but about him. He was fond of contrasting the loose, autonomous work rhythms of traditional cultivators with the tight-knit, interdependent discipline of the factory. Thus, machine ideology destroys yet another brain and brings with it the misery of discipline and specialization. I think it's really funny that, like, I guess it's mostly Marxist-Leninists that do this, but they're always talking about both liberation and discipline without seeing any contradiction between those. Yeah, it's a very common... I mean, I, I really can't see a way those are not contradictory. Maybe I'm wrong, but discipline to me implies, like, obedience. Well, this is like the Foucauldian thing, right? Is that uh, discipline is also sort of like the internalized rhythms of, like, the subject in accordance with it. And the, uh, like, Republican ideal of freedom is sort of... Uh, alignment of the self with the state and like the, re the Republican virtue is like, uh, this self-discipline, right? So mm -hmm. in their minds, uh, like self-discipline is the basis for freedom. And I think this is, this is this notion of Republican virtue and self-discipline actually is very common among like leftist ideas. What was that thing that everyone made fun of Luna Oy for the like, Oh, socialist manners. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Socialist manners. Exactly. That's what that reminds me of. That's a direct, that's a direct descendant, uh, <laughs> Uh, of this idea, yeah, yeah. All right, there's a a short subsection here called "A Streamlined People and Their Crops," uh, where Scott points out that there are terms that have aesthetic symbolic meaning to everyone, such as the term "streamline," which is used as a stand-in for anything that could conceivably resemble efficiency or smoothness. Um, but in practice, like it usually just means like cutting social services or uh, making an organization more authoritarian. Um, so in Tanzania, the streamlining of the Tanzanian people is represented by villages that were essentially a miles long single row of houses along a main road. Um, and the logic of this was the ease of reaching and monitoring all the villagers, despite it making no other kind of sense to lay out a village that way. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Scott says the Ujamaa village was essentially a point-by-point -point negation of existing rural practice, which is not streamlined at all. 
So yeah, there there wasn't a, a ton of stuff in there, but um, I think there might have been a picture of the miles long single row of houses in there, uh, which is wild to look at. And I, I think he said one of the settlements that were like that, they like had someone move their house like 30 feet to make it like along the row. And that actually happens like quite a few times in, in this chapter. Um, the bureaucrats asking someone to move their house like 20 or 30 feet to like make it perfectly straight. <laughs> um, so the next bit is communal farming and intensive production. So the first five-year plan of TINU made it clear that they viewed resettlement as a prerequisite for modernizing agriculture. However, the siting of villages made little sense for accomplishing this since they were often in semi-arid climates unsuitable for farming. Um, if I remember right, they, they basically just like picked areas that were like flat and empty. Um, right, which makes sense for villagization, but not for villages. Yes, um, so the detrimental effect on food production made it necessary to import huge quantities of food between 1974 and, or sorry, 1973 and 75 on the order of 1.2 billion shillings. And I think that was like British shillings and not, um, not just Tanzanian shillings. Um, from 1967 to 1975, State-controlled agriculture resembled the colonial policies of minimum planting requirements, which were enforced with rationing. Um, afterward, like uh, the rationing was like uh, school services and clean water and stuff like that were rationed. Um, and afterward, it more closely resembled Soviet collective farms. Doubly so because it was planned by bureaucrats and accomplished with something akin to corvée labor. Um, so resentment by the populace and reluctance by local officials – to enforce the system led to it breaking down very quickly. And the replacement for it was similar to the colonial system with the addition of concentrated farms that were easier to monitor thanks to like their earlier projects that created these concentrated plots of land. Um, Scott gives a quote from the third five-year plan that shows how little the villagization project differed from colonialization. Uh, so it says... In the rural sector, the party has had great success in resettling the rural peasantry in villages where it is now possible to identify able-bodied individuals able to work and also to identify the acreage available for agricultural purposes. The plan intends to make sure that in every workplace, rural or urban, our implementing organs set specific work targets each year. And uh, later, agricultural development calls for setting up work timetables and production targets. Um, Nerere believes the crucial part of the project was to overcome the farmer's apathy and attachment to outmoded practices. Uh, in his first broadcast as PM, he said, if you have cotton unpicked on your shamba, if you have cultivated half an acre less than you could cultivate, if you are letting the soil run needlessly off your land, or if your shamba is full of weeds, if you deliberately ignore the advice given to you by the agricultural experts, then you are a traitor in the battle. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, don't, I don't see how that discourse can end poorly. <laughs> right. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, that's, that's interesting that, like, uh, I thought the Operation Planned Villages uh, was, like, the start of the militaristic rhetoric, but that was a uh, traitor in battles, obviously pretty militaristic as well. Well, they they inherited that from other socialist states, so right, exactly, yeah. And it, it's not like uh, uh, there's a context to that that was sort of probably probably unavoidable in some sense, you know, in a in a in a, in a short term sense, right? Like, mm -hmm. like I don't, I mean, the terms conquest of labor and conquest of land are often mentioned in the critique of colonialism now, but those are actually socialist terms in origin. Interesting. Yeah. So conquest of labor isn't like disciplining workers into a proletariat or? Uh, it's like the self-disciplining into a proletariat. Oh, okay. It's so like the creation the creation of a working class rather than a capitalist or lumpen or peasant or uh, or bourgeois or anything or professional, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so for this uh, agricultural revolution modernization the experts demanded of course monocropping in straight neat rows 
uh, whereas polycropping was the more common practice among ex- existing farmers. Uh, while even then there was mounting evidence that monocropping produced lower yields and was ecologically destructive, it was, on the other hand, much easier for managers to deal with. So, you know, it's a wash on whether or not it's good. Uh, it facilitates inspections, yield and acreage calculations, brackets variables, streamlines the job of statesmen, and simula- uh, simplifies control of the harvest. <laughs> Uh, so the next section is bureaucratic convenience, bureaucratic interests. So Scott says there was a tendency in the Ujamaa campaign for the bureaucrats to reinterpret the campaign's goals in order to make them easier to achieve. Further, they reinterpret the goals to be more in line with corporate interests. Uh, both of these are to say that existing power structures change the outcome of social transform- transformations run by bureaucrats. I wish there was more detail on the... Um, reinterpreting goals to be more in line with corporate interests. Well, because remember, remember, they're trying to create export crops, right? So that means they have to go through uh, multinational corporate. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. So that makes sense. Yeah. Corporations need certain kinds of crops, certain kinds of whatever. And they have, you know, I mean, because there's only so many exporters. Yeah. I don't, yeah you know what I'm saying? Like, right. If yes. you're trying to sell to a European American market, you're going to deal with European and American corporations. Right. And even if you're not, even if you're working with, you know, so Soviet, like the Soviet Bureau of Trade, you're still going to have to deal with their equivalent of those requirements. So, right. Yeah. That makes me wonder, like, um, I mean, I've, I've thought about this, like every time it comes up, but uh, we did an episode on uh, Venezuela and how like the uh, famines in Venezuela are like mainly seem to be caused by like U S corporations like Polar, which is like a subsidiary of PepsiCo or something like that. And, um, Cargill, which is the largest, uh, privately owned, like non-publicly traded business. Yeah. Cargill's really bad. Well, Venezuela, I guess also like this case though, is a, it's about the conjunction of international political economy with, uh, local, uh, bureaucratic incompetence and well-meaning socialist ideology. Yeah. But like the thing I, that I was wondering is like, like, why don't they just get rid of the? Why, why don't they just get rid of those corporations? Like, I don't really get. I don't know what's because they because they because they're, they're, they need to ex, they need to sell to export markets to earn export revenues to industrialize. Right. They don't really have a choice there. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I guess you just answered that. <laughs> right. They don't really have a choice. That's the thing. That's the that's the thing about internet. That's why what's his name like a uh, Samir Amin or Samir Amin? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, he proposed like countries unlinking themselves entirely from the global capitalist market. Which sounds fine in theory, except one has to ask how they would do that. Mm-hmm. He never really answered that question. But um, anyway. Yeah, there's some country that Scott mentions like toward the end of the chapter that, or maybe it was in a Twitter thread that I saw today, but about uh, a country in Southeast Asia like trying to create a moneyless autarky. Well, did, uh, either DPRK or Myanmar. I think it, I think it might have been Myanmar, yeah. And Cambodia, too. Oh, that's what it was. Cambodia. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess that didn't work, huh? <laughs> that didn't work so well, no. <laughs> um, was it because they were trying to both do that and have an industrial state, or was it something else? Well, this no, no. They were de-industrializing on purpose. Oh, okay. De-industrializing and de-urbanizing. Yeah, this is a, the uh, the Khmer Rouge, you know, under Pol Pot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know a ton about them. Oh yeah, no, they were totally nice guys. Uh, <laughs> I've heard, yeah. Everybody, they are renowned for their uh, charity and justice in their treatment of people, and they really, really liked urban intellectuals. <laughs> I had this brainworm from a Facebook group that I was in in like 2015 of uh, someone commenting on a thread with just the words "based pull pot." Yeah, so that was like, like every time I think of pull pot, I just think of that comment. I don't know why it's stuck in my brain so much, but <laughs> it just sounded funny to me, I guess. Uh, baseball pot is like one of the like few positions that's like you could be like that's like still edgy and like on the edge of like <laughs> like 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 everybody's a dangus now or something, but like if you're a pol- if you're a fan of pole pot, that's still considered like edgy even among the more extreme uh types. 
All right, this uh, this podcast is now friends with uh, Pol Pot. Pol Pot, friend oh, of the God. show. <laughs> oh my God! Don't say that. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Where was I? Okay, yeah, the cor- reinterpreting goals in line with corporate interests. Um, so the first tendency, which was reinterpret goals in order to make them easier to achieve, uh, came mostly in the form of the displacement of goals towards strictly qual- quantitative, sorry, the displacement of goals toward strictly quantitative criteria of performance. The criteria used were things like number of people moved, new villages created, house lots and communal field surveys, surveyed, wells drilled, areas cleared and plowed, tons of fertilizer delivered, and TANU branches set up. Which, like, most of those sound awful. <laughs> number of people moved... <laughs> Like, damn. Those are all means to the end becoming uh, means to means. Yeah, what's that, uh, that law? Is it, like, Carhartt's law? Not Carhartt's law. Goodhart's law, right? Uh, I don't know. What is it? It's, uh... When a, when a target becomes a metric, it ceases to... Yes. Uh, when a metric becomes a target, it ceases to function as a metric? Yeah, that exactly. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's true. And the uh, James Scott lesson is that all, basically all... All metrics become targets. <laughs> yeah, but when, when wielded by bureaucrats. Yeah. And it, not for anything, not for any reason of malice. Yeah. Even, or like whatever. It's just that this is like how information flows work in that situation. So it's kind of hard for it to be otherwise. And I guess it's not only do all metrics become targets, but all targets become metrics, which is what's happening here. Yeah, they, well, they, yeah, they, they cease to uh, have any difference. Yeah. Yeah. Another factor in this reinterpreting goals to make them easier to achieve was the competitiveness and publicity driving bureaucrats to do as much as possible, uh, which I didn't think of this at the time, but this reminds me of the Millennium Development Goals thing where like uh, supposedly, what is it, one billion people were lifted out of poverty, whatever that bullshit number is. Um, the original goal was like lifting one third of the world's population uh, to above the international poverty line, which at the time was like much higher than it is now. And then it was later interpreted to like some other figure where basically what they did was they took that original fraction and multiplied the current world population by that fraction. And um, because they achieved the reinterpreted goal, they uh, just publicized it as like, oh, uh, we interpreted the, or we uh, achieved the original goal, which means we lifted a billion people out of poverty. Hmm. <laughs> but then, of course, the the other issue is like um, the number of people living on like $5 a day like increased in the same time period, which was like the immiseration of all those people. Um. So it's like a, a bad target in the first place on top of them reinterpreting the metric to make it easier for them to achieve. And now that that same Millennium Development Goal thing is repeated by pro-Chinese Communist Party people for some reason. <laughs> they tried to claim it the difference, but uh, it's sort of indisputable that it's like the same definition. Yeah. So it's hilarious. And it basically means that like a lot of people went from not having to survive off of money to having to survive off of money and only making that much money. Yeah. At a lower standard than before. Yeah. So like if they had gone on the market and sold the equivalent of their goods and services that they had had before, even that would be higher than, uh, what their current money income is, but let alone if they had just consumed it directly themselves, like they were doing. So, right. But so now they get, uh, but so they get forced off of the traditional life ways and they end up with both less money and less direct production than before. So, yeah. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, less of the money equivalent, but they have more money because before they weren't part of the market. Well, see, you might not know this cause you don't, you probably don't read quite as many econ papers as I do, but, um, you know, people actually can't consume what they produce. Oh yeah. Uh, that's like a basic, uh, foundational assumption of economics models. So, um, that wouldn't exist, you know. Bureaucrats would also avoid giving any of the villages in the Ujamaa campaign uh, any significant power independence. Um, 
villages or other organizations so that, you know, obviously they wouldn't want something being out of their control if they're trying to accomplish the goals set out for them. Um, so if there was any opportunity to let something go outside of their control, they wouldn't do that. Um, Scott compares the villagization plan to a vast, albeit non-contiguous, state plantation. Quoting the text, It seems incredible in retrospect that any state could proceed with so much hubris and so little information and planning to the dislocation of so many million lives. It seems, again in retrospect, a wild and irrational scheme which was bound to fail both the expectations of its planners and the material and social needs of its hapless victims. And he says the scheme was not even unique to the TANU. The same techno-economic vision was shared until very late in the game by the World Bank, United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, and other development agencies contributing to Tanzanian development, which I, I thought that was one of the most ironic things about this whole thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I was saying earlier. Like, uh, like everything, uh, all the reasons that you would think that uh, a priori would usually make you think that this would make it succeed actually worked against it, right? So, like, it's not like you had, like, the imperialist powers uh, uh, opposed to this, like, socialist who was trying to fight against them in this uphill battle. They actually agreed on the, on the, on the means and ends. So, in theory, you know, according to the, like, the center-left narrative is like, oh, if it weren't for the imperialists, like, these, like, socialist projects would work, right? It's like, okay, what if the World Bank is actually in agreement with the local socialist parties on development, right? So, like, uh, and it still fails, right? So, I also think it's funny and ironic that, like, modern socialists, at least, maybe not at this time, I don't, I don't know enough, but modern socialists have a rightful knee-jerk reaction to anything that the World Bank and USAID is doing. And it's, like, you know, one of the main, like, famous villains of the modern, like, internationalist or uh, anti-imperialist left. Uh, right, but then even the people who say that will then, like, endorse things that the World Bank has, like, endorsed, as long as you don't <laughs> tell them that they're endorsed by them. Oh, okay. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, like uh, yeah. I, actually, there's this really good book, oh, I forget, I'm forgetting the title, but it analyzed from the other direction, like, uh, the uh, international, like IMF and World Bank, and like the provisioning of aid and the strictness of loans and conditions like that. And um, it was very interesting. So it's like, okay, uh, is it about like coherence with policy or is it about like shared ideology that produces this? So what they found was that like if you had um, a country that had neoliberally trained economists, but they were implementing socialist policies. They would still get treated better than if you had like socialist educated economists producing like standard uh, World Bank and IMF style policies. So such that like actually uh, like it, it, in other words, uh, they, they responded well to people who were ideologically and professionally similar to themselves, even if they were proposing um, like uh, opposite policies to what they say are necessary and then people who are even proposing the ones that were like what they said were necessary they would get a less positive reaction if they were not trained and ideologically similar you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so it was actually like the coherence of ideologies and the shared backgrounds and the networks of elites that mattered more than like say like it wasn't like they're like oh we hate these socialist goals and policies it would be like it would be the, the specific implementers that mattered interesting I don't know. It's very interesting. I'll, I'll, send, I'll send it to you. I'll find it and send you it. But yeah. yeah, that'd be good to read. That makes me think of how, um, I mean, this is just from like discussions online, but like a lot of people will argue against something like leftist or anarchist that I'm saying and cite like a neoliberal economist because that economist agrees with the point that they're making. Right. Which I always find funny. Anyway, so Scott notes that despite the speed, breadth, and ubiquitous use of force of the villagization scheme, it uh, doesn't even compare to the brutality or excess of the Soviet collectivization program. Uh, the combination of a weak state, a tepid feeling in favor of using force, and the strength of the Tanzanian peasantry uh, relative to the state meant that it was not nearly as destructive. So even though he has all these criticisms, he wants to situate it in terms of like Soviet collectivization was much worse 
and also um they at least had like some like more legitimacy than the uh same like the colonial rulers before them mm-hmm. yeah it's just like another place where it's like uh these are things that should be working in the favor of its uh, successes when at best they tempered its failures. Well, or yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah. They tempered some of the brutality, but they still didn't, they still contributed to the failures, I guess. So the next section he starts talking about a similar program in Ethiopia, mm-hmm. uh, which I wish I had given myself more time to like read a, read up on the background and um, outcomes of this, because it seems to have uh, like a lot to do with the uh, Tigray genocide that's happening right now. Mm-hmm. But so, for those who don't know, Ethiopia from Post World War II to around 1974 was ruled by Haile Selassie, also known as Ja to the Rastafari people, um, and he carried out a project of rapid Westernization until he was deposed in a coup in 1974. And so the next group to take control of Ethiopia were uh, Meng- Mengistu, Mengistu, Haile Mariam, the Marxist Leninist, and uh, and the Derg. I like that name, the Derg even though they're, they seem bad. Uh, they are a Marxist-Leninist junta and Soviet ally in Africa that ruled until 1991, so from 74 to 91. Um, and the Derg also tried to create uh, carry out a forced settlement program, uh, and they made a similar argument to Nyerere. Uh, so this is a quote from them. The scattered and haphazard habitation and livelihood of Ethiopian peasants cannot build socialism. Insofar as es- efforts are dispersed and livelihood is individual, the results are only hand-to-mouth existence amounting to fruitless struggle and drudgery, which cannot build a prosperous society. So they also wanted to create socialism by forcing people to live in villages. Um, Men, I don't know how I should pronounce this guy's name. Menjistu? I think that sounds more correct. Uh, also viewed agrarian society negatively and pastoral society even more so. Uh, however, he did not share TANU's reluctance to use force. After only one year, the Derg claimed to have settled 4.6 million peasants into 4,500 villages. Despite echoing the rhetoric of carrying out the program to provide government services, many villages had none of those. Uh, the villages were extremely uniform and geometric, with everything being set in units of 1,000. So if you didn't notice already, 4.6 million into 4,500 villages, so they're about a thousand uh, occupants per village. The forcibly settled populations were well aware of the uh, surveillance and control aspect of the plan. Um, so they knew that the reason they were being put into these villages was for them to be more easily subdued by the state. Um, non-state and semi-state spaces such as private shops, tea houses, and small trading establishments were replaced with government controlled spaces such as, the village's mass organization and peasant association offices, literacy shed, health clinic, or a state cooperative shop. I, I was curious what a literacy shed is. I, that's not something I've ever heard of. It's a shit. You go into it and you learn to read. <laughs> well, yeah, but I thought there might be more to it than that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> getting hung up on this. <laughs> so... Uh, Scott says the statistics of deaths caused by the campaign don't really capture its tra- tragedy. This is a direct quote from the book. The new settlements nearly always failed their inhabitants as human communities and as units of food production. The very fact of massive resettlement nullified a precious legacy of local agricultural and pastoral knowledge, and with it, some thirty to 40,000 functioning communities, most of them in regions that had regularly produced food surpluses. I One of the f- few things I tweeted recently was... Uh, that kind of made me think about how often people in the U S move and how that might contribute to the like lack of rebelliousness of the U S population. It's not so easy to rebel when you don't have a, you know, stable functioning social network, which is like a point that he's made repeatedly. Uh, yeah, but, it, but also, but also sedentariness 
also makes it harder to rebel too. So like the suburbs make it hard to rebel. Mm. Uh, mobility in and of itself actually is uh, conducive to rebellion. The optimal, like if you were to be neoclassical economist about this and draw a diagram, <laughs> the optimal intersection for rebellion is where you have maximal social networks, but also maximal mobility. Right. So uh, because there's plenty of people in America who are very uh, sedentary, but still alienated. And then there are plenty of mobile people who are, Mm-hmm. Uh, have a social community so it's not it's not necessarily the mobility is i mean of itself it's the uh pre-existing alienation right but i do think like uh i mean i pulled up a map of like people that have moved to like totally different cities as a percent of population and in the u.s it's extremely high like in the last five years like over 21 percent of americans have moved to a different city or state um i, I don't know if that's uh actually considered that high i mean i think it used to be higher first of all well, it was, a, it was a world map, so uh, relative to other, like most other countries, it's the highest in the world, other than like Norway and Finland. Oh, really? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and in like most South American and Asian countries, it's like five percent or less, six to ten percent or less. But what about the massive waves of urbanization occurring there? H- huge numbers of people. I don't know. I it was it was a pretty brief report. It was a uh, Gallup, I think from 2011 i think yeah i have to i'd have to look into this because migration is very high i don't know rate rates are very high anyway uh yeah yeah uh so scott further elaborates that resettlement goes far beyond just a change of scenery it turns someone who is an expert in their locale into a useless or ignorant laborer completely dependent on the state for survival only in such circumstances was it possible for camp officials to reduce migrants to mendicants whose obedience and labor could be exacted for subsistence rations. I really liked that uh, sentence. I, th- I thought that was really well written. Although there were droughts at the time of this program, uh, which were uh, the uh, the blame for forced migration and subsequent famine were cast on those droughts, it was really the loss of subsistence knowledge that was responsible for the famines. All right, so we're at the conclusion section, which has a couple of subsections, but um, they're pretty short, so I'll just read all the way through. Uh, So Scott disputes whether the supposedly rational and scientific plans of villagization were actually rational and scientific, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, It was instead, he says, an aesthetic and teleology of modern rural production and community life. Um, so they saw this like, uh, you know, American Euro American model of like large, uh, mechanized farms in rural areas. And they just wanted to copy that. Uh, so whereas the peasants on the other hand were staunch empiricists who did what worked and adjusted to changing in local conditions, the supposedly rational and scientific bureaucrats and professionals were driven by a quasi-religious enthusiasm made even more potent in being backed by the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, like, idea that, like, since something has to be done about it, by definition, that means that um, it has to be done. Like, there has to be an actor doing it, which means just letting people do their own thing is impossible, is inconsistent with that. Right, yeah. Which is why, like, like you, I would argue it's functionally impossible to have a view toward policy that doesn't like that can even accommodate sort of like local because everyone says, Oh, then why don't you just like accommodate the local conditions or whatever? But it's like, okay, but how, like, I don't think it's possible. Yeah. By doing nothing, I guess. (laughs) Basically. Yeah. I guess that's why like, um, the difference between like, you know, any given state and a like colonial settler state is like more one of degree. I would say a colonial settler state is just the imminent tendency of the state. Right combined with the imminent imminent tendency of human migration. Yeah. And and because like, you know, while colonial states obviously uh, kind of infantilize the population to a large degree, all states have to do that essentially. Yes. And, and I mean, you can see that in like, uh, especially the rhetoric of like the, the Democrats of the last like bunch of years basically treating themselves as like the only adults in the room and everyone else who anyone who disagrees with them as uh, stupid little children who don't know what they're talking about and have to like read a book or whatever. And the cops do that except in a murderous way. Mm-hmm. Yes. And MLs do that as well. Right. 
Of course they do. Yeah. Again, because this requires this attitude of the outward state that's doing something to the irrational, misguided people who don't know anything about anything. Right. And I think that a lot of the like excesses of colonial management, um, you know, comes from obviously from that same tendency, but also from like the fact that they're managing like what they perceive as an outgroup, like to a you know an even greater degree than like a state that's managing a population within, within its own borders. But I mean, but uh, but like think about like in the Scott book, right? Like he opens up with german forestry right and then Mm -hmm. and then we're now we're now we're talking about german colonies right so a lot of the techniques that were developed for the colonies were first developed in the state itself and then exported Mm -hmm. and then this post-colonial regime picked those up uh and did them their own way so it shows that there's a contiguous legacy of the state's transmission to this in a pre-colonial colonial and post-colonial context, right? So the only commonality across those three, besides Germans, is the state. Yeah, that's a good point. And, uh, and there's no, and then, and then only, and, you know, it's no accident that those are the two most uh, evil things in history, so. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Uh, oh, yeah, f- further, the, uh, the quasi-religious enthusiasm that we just mentioned had a direct relation to the status and interests of its bearers who saw themselves as self-conscious modernizers and therefore required a sharp and morally loaded contrast between what looked modern and what looked primitive. And this vision would be applied from the center onto everything else, uh, which he compares to like point perspective in Renaissance painting where like everything converges to one point. Mm -hmm. Um, But in this case, it's like the opposite everything like the the whole view converges from the center outward. Yeah. And the very idea that a large polity could operate this way in the first place is uh as he says enormously flattering to elites at the apex and a self reass- or sorry, a reassuring self-hypnosis which serves to reinforce the moral moral purpose and self-confidence of the elites and is of course demeaning to everyone else. Yeah. I I like how he put that though. Enormously flattering <laughs> to elites at the apex. I, there's a funny section in uh, the book Black Shirts and Reds where Parenti mm-hmm. is critiquing what he calls like leftist critiques of communists. And so he's criticizing Chomsky because Chomsky argues that Marxist-Leninism as an ideology is attractive to professional class types who uh, see themselves as managers and uh, professional revolutionaries who get to like uh, become the elites by their, uh, their uh, virtue. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I don't see that tendency at all. Uh, right, and so he uh, he's like very uh, mad at Chomsky for saying this. It's very funny. <laughs> the one thing I, I like, I've been on Twitter a little more today than I have in the past like month, but uh, the one thing that I've seen today is mainly about um, Isha, which I mean I I don't even really have to say any more than that. Like that Wait, kind of proves Isha? that whole thesis. Oh 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 Isha the yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're very, very annoying. <laughs> Why? What did they say today? It was something about uh, Lorenzo Combo Irvin um, being like a a bad faith actor uh, and like a a drag on on the Black Panthers or something like that. Hmm. And this was, you know, the conclusion she reached after like ha- going from having not heard about him at all to like reading one thing uh, linked to her about it. So. Huh. That uh, that is not directly apropos of it in this, but did you see the person the other day who said that like uh, uh, the uh, U.S. left has an anarchist problem and, and the anarchists need to be like you? Know, that's what stem. That's what this stemmed from. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's really funny. Yeah, especially because the person who said that l- looks to me to be like you know, like bohemian white lady from some gentrified part of New York City. Oh, she looked very young to me. Right. That's why I, I always, I see, they see, I've always, a lot of, a lot of the time it's like the youngest uh, people who have had literally no experience in anything that are making these grand proclamations. Yeah. One of the uh, top responses in that, in that thread was uh, someone saying like, I used to be a state socialist. And the thing that made me not be a state socialist anymore was because I actually like wanted to do stuff and like make change happen. And the only people that were actually doing that were anarchists. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> I think that's a common experience, actually. 
Yeah. I've heard that quite a few times. Yeah. Like, there's also the anarchist to, uh, to ML type, but that's usually kind of like the opposite. It's like uh, people who came into politics by not doing anything, and they continued to wanting to not do things. And so they found that uh, uh, ML ideology was easier for them to not do things than anarchism. As in, as in what I mean, like, uh, they're like, oh, yeah, I used to be an anarchist, but uh, it didn't work. And then, you know, it's like, oh, what did you do to be an anarchist? And it's like they didn't do anything, right? And so right. then it's like, and so, in other words, like, they wanted to be able to, like, talk about politics and, like, say a bunch of shit and then have that, like, be construed as doing something. And then anarchism was not amenable to that. Yeah. Or, or like, have the appearance of right making accomplishments or, like being able to identify with uh, people who have made some accomplishments and use that to like talk down to people. Right. Basically like stealing valor from revolutionaries in other countries, which is like, seems to be the favorite activity of that type of person. Yeah. I mean, they'll be like, they'll like put themselves in the same tradition. They'll be like, it's like, Oh, you're insulting MLs online. Oh yeah. Well, you're insulting Che Guevara then. And it's like, Oh Yeah. Thomas Sankara, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So I, uh, it's like by me making me calling you a a, a silly goose. I'm insulting uh, Che Guevara. Very <laughs> interesting. You know, it's like very funny. I don't know. <laughs> so let's see. Enormously flattering. Uh, I don't even remember how we got on that, but anyway. Uh, oh, you know what? This uh, this is actually kind of related because um, one of the other things I was thinking about was. Um, there's like some fresh drama with Philly DSA that I am too lazy to look into, but like I was also thinking about how a lot of uh, like the status types like to take over uh, socialist orgs and just kind of like be in charge of them without like doing anything, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, this next quote from the book is, Redesigning the lines and boxes in an organizational chart is simpler than changing how that organization, in fact, operates. <laughs> and that, that kind of uh, segues right into it. So Scott's talking. This subsection is called The Failure of Grids. And Scott, I think for the second time in this book, brings up the work to rule strike, uh, where workers just follow regulations exactly as they're written. Yeah, I love that. Which causes complete deadlock because actual work involves you know, all these like implicit assumptions and and destroys everything, uh, different relations and stuff and constant adjustments. Yeah. And the best part though, too, is that like the management can't really like stop a work to rule strike because like with, without just being totally arbitrary and violating their own rules, which I mean, they'll be willing to do usually, but like at the same time, they can't, uh, individually sanction workers like one at a time for like, you know, violations or something. Cause they're technically following the rules. And uh, so instead, they either just like they, they the only thing they can really do is be totally arbitrary and openly violate their own thing, but which I'm sure makes them look bad to outside observers, right? And uh, and to their uh, higher ups as well. So uh, yeah, so you know you get like a interesting uh, dynamic that way. But yeah, I I really like work to rule strikes there as a like a thing. Yeah, it was very cool. Yeah, so work to roll strike. Uh, a village, city, or language is the jointly created, partly unintended product of many, many hands. Uh, is another thing he talks about in the section. Um, so he's talking about how you know there were attempts to create artificial languages like Esperanto, which he calls a thin language with no cultural context to make it like sophisticated or deep. And he quotes a common saying among linguists. That a national language is a dialect with an army, which I really liked. Yeah, that's actually a quote originally from Yiddish. Oh, really? Yes, but uh, it is a common linguistics quote. I really like it. Yeah, a language is a dialect with the is a dialect with the navy. Yeah, <laughs> but um, so I didn't I didn't really know like I guess what specific point he's trying to make in this section, but um, you know. It, it had some interesting stuff in it about the failure of grids. Yeah. It kind of just seemed like a collection of facts more than like a, something with a specific point. Well, it's a restatement of his general points, right. About how like, uh, uh, the needs of, uh, 
managers and bureaucrats and the state require a kind of simplicity and orderliness that cannot be found in the world in the world, which always depends on a substantive, actually existing cultural reality. Uh, and so, uh, you know, artificially constructed languages, although I would actually, there actually has like a culture developed around Esperanto, but, um, uh, but uh, in general, like artificially constructed languages, yeah, if they don't have the, uh, the real culture and stuff around them, they aren't going to be like a thick thing. They're just going to be sort of like a, a superficial facsimile, mm-hmm. uh, but they would be more orderly to the state. Um, and that's why, you know, like official language institutes of states are constantly fighting language change. You know what I mean? Um, like, uh, like in France and so on. But, um, yeah. And so like the grid is the synecdoche for like this broader, uh, dynamic because the grid is like the bureaucratic organizational tool for space and people like it's the intrinsic and fundamental it's like the highest uh idealization of it right because you can just stack everything and order it Mm -hmm. and control it in a legible manner but like life doesn't work on grids right i mean yeah yeah because you know in order like if you already have a grid then planning in it is possible but if you are uh trying to make a world that isn't already into a grid you have to literally flatten it and empty it of content and reorganize it and shape it in a very substantial way to make it that orderly way. So anyway, but yeah. Yeah. That makes me think of like, um, one of the like basic, but really important parts of like permaculture farming is just like not planting everything in like regular straight rows and actually following the contour of the land that you're Mm -hmm. farming on, which is like is a huge deal, uh, but almost never done. That's a great example, right? Uh, and even permaculture is always going to be balancing sort of like a kind of planning style thing with mm-hmm. the local uh, local conditions, and it's going to be this back and forth. Yeah. So even that, you know, Stephen still has some sort of like because of of course it, it's inescapable to have some kind of like planning or whatever. But in the political science literature, the way that this sort of dealt dealt is dealt with between the like uh, top level grid and the actually existing world, and it's connected to the idea of a work to rule strike in many ways is a is through the um, idea of the street level bureaucrat and the street level bureaucrats job is to enforce the rules by breaking the rules basically. <laughs> so like social, so, social workers and cops and so on are the ones who are actually like literally on the street uh-huh. implementing, implementing the policies of bureaucrats, but the policy like the, like on the street doesn't actually obey the laws of the grid and the directives. And if they wanted to actually implement the stated goals, they can't really follow those rules and directives. So you have street level bureaucrats negotiating that and like uh, in, doing this back and forth, and of course that becomes that becomes itself becomes a messy and violent uh, process. Uh, yeah, and also it creates a thing a system where the bureaucrats themselves can always escape accountability because any failures can now be passed off to the uh, people who the street level bureaucrats who broke rules and regulations. So you can just say, oh look, the street level bureaucrats True. broke rules and regulations, but of course. They need to to do their job. Yeah, I mean, not like the, not that I'm saying, but like, I mean, that's obviously a bad thing. Like, we don't necessarily, like, we don't want them to do their job necessarily. But uh, it's, still, it's just like uh, it creates a a perverse system where you have to have people constantly breaking the rules to make things work at all, which is like similar to how it's like a, a work work to rule strikes work because the people break the rules to make things work, and then uh, when everybody. F- uh, but it also creates a discretion and a, uh, uh, and a responsibility uh, problem where basically the people who actually have to implement things can always be blamed because they uh, the the things they do to implement them will get them in trouble, mm-hmm. uh, technically violate the rules, while those who created the absurd things and goals and directives can always disclaim that responsibility. Um, now... The contrast to this, though, I guess, is that uh, this used to that sort of comes from an older day, I think, in America too, because like uh, there's a, some degree of even now more immunity among street level bureaucrats than ever before, too. So true. Uh, so it's actually kind of interesting because it's just the accountability now just goes all the way up. Uh, unaccountability just goes all the way up and down, which is kind of interesting. But I guess the accountability goes on to the people that they're managing. You know. Exactly. Yeah. So and I, I'm sure that like. It's not new per se. That's like a return of an, a previous thing, but uh-huh. you know, that's probably just like a constant cycle of states as such. 
that go through reformist periods of accountability and periods of just like strict authoritarian whatever. And it's like the people who have failed the policies in the state, not the state who have failed the people in the policies. Yeah. Although, again, I'll say from like the state's perspective, like that's like like correct in a way, like we did fail the states in their policies and we're going to. Yeah. And like, so I, like the state has to think that way. That's the other thing. Like you can't like reform the state so that it doesn't think that way. Cause that's like how it has to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, all good points. Okay. So the last little bit is, um, the miniaturization of perfection and control. And it's a section just talking about miniaturization as a way to create control over complex systems. And he gives the examples of, uh, architectural models, gardens, bonsai, uh, weird dog breeds, uh, doll houses, and so on. <laughs> Mostly what I took away from the first section was I've never heard of Bonseki, and it's really cool. It's, like, really pretty. Um, what is it? Bonseki, it's like uh, it's like bonsai, but um, you create, like, a, like, the image of a landscape out of, like, rocks and sand and stuff. Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So there, uh, the examples that I saw were, like... Uh, making waterfalls where the like the sand is water and uh they have like rocks peeking through it and stuff well so you're endorsing you're literally endorsing high modernist uh uh uh, schemes that are doomed to failure yeah and sand mining yeah there you go (laughs) see wow you're basically a fascist (laughs) let's see uh he also talks about how capital cities as we have already seen with Brasilia are often miniatures of high modernist visions of the world. And he's basically saying that like um, a lot of this stuff comes from like the realization that the real world and nature and society and all that stuff are like too difficult to control. So you sort of retreat into something that is controllable as like, you know, a balm for yourself essentially. Um, And so he's using capital cities as, as like an example of where um, they are, creating miniatures of what they would want society to look like. Um, and they do it in the capital because, you know, that's where most of the administrators and bureaucrats are and where they have the most control. But notably the administrators and bureaucrats hate being subjects of their own system. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like in Brasilia, like, you know, they didn't like the officials didn't like living in the, in the, uh, in the official part of the city. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's like how, um, I live around DC and like not many people like want to live in the city yeah. compared to the number of people that live in Southern Maryland and Northern Virginia. Yeah, like the outlying areas. Yeah. Yeah. They would rather live in like Ashburn where there's like, you know, giant, uh, malls full of high end stores for them to go to instead of like, and, 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 uh, large single family homes instead of like cramped row houses and stuff. And the cool parts of the city are the ones that, like, the state doesn't have – are not like not the tourist or official government parts of the city. Yeah. The cool parts of the city, from their perspective, are the ones where basically, like, no one lives and it's just, like, a bunch of shops. Yeah. Whereas the ones – I hate those parts of D.C. But uh, – <laughs> it's, it's really hard to get around in them, too. Yeah. And I've noticed that. You kind of just come into them and out of them. You can't really, like – I don't know. It's, like, weird. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, when uh, when Chris was on the show regularly, I would go to his house in Petworth, and the drive was basically like going on this insanely long, like two lane road with almost no like it had like no real intersections. It was like kind of like a mini highway, um, mm-hmm. and it just goes all around the circumference of the city, um, so that you can like get through the like insane grid pattern. Like grid slash, I don't know what you would call it, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Like the well, DC DC's a grid, yeah. It's like a grid, but not like well, right? But that's that's because all grids fail. But DC yeah. is a classic grid city. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it's also like supposedly built to be like confusing for invaders or whatever. So it has like yeah, like parts that are in a, in a grid, but then like they're in like fragments. Hmm. And have like spokes in them and stuff like that. It's weird. Um, wheel and spoke, yeah. But yeah, anyway. Uh, so Scott gives the examples of uh, New Delhi, 
uh, which were which was the new capital of India built by the British colonizers, and it was basically like intended to be a negation of uh, old Delhi. Um, and they built it as like a a monumental uh, architectural city to like stun residents with their like huge buildings and domination of nature and carefully controlled like straight uh, geometric structure. Um, and then on the other hand, he you have Dodoma, which is the new capital of Tanzania, planned by Nyerere, with um, intentionally modest buildings that require no elevators or air conditioning and uh, flow more with the natural landscape. Uh, but as he points out, both of these are like utopian miniatures of what they wanted society to look like. Right. Either way, yeah, because they both require standardization and top-down planning and idealization and simplification and caricature and critification and uh, ideologization and sentimentalization and so on and so on and so on and so on. Right. Yeah. Um, and then finally, uh, he talks about one more form of miniaturization, which like, I think you could call it like social distillation or something like that, where like a small group of ideal candidates uh, for something is picked out from amongst a less desirable or more resistant population. Mm-hmm. Uh, so quoting directly from the book, uh, still another variant was the attempt to distill out of the general population a cadre of pro- progressive farmers who would then be mobilized to practice modern agriculture. Such policies were followed in elaborate detail in Mozambique and were important in colonial Tanzania as well. When the state confronted, quote, a, b- a brick wall of peasant conservatism, notes a 1956 document from Tanganyika Department of Agriculture, it became necessary, quote, to withdraw the effort from some portions so as to concentrate on small selected points, a procedure which has come to be known as the focal point approach. What's interesting about that is that this creates, this creates very easily can create adverse selection because um, presumably like using selection effects so that you have an ideal audience or target for something actually isn't like a bad idea if you're from a policy perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, If you're trying to achieve a goal, I mean, it's going to be an artificial goal. It's not necessarily replicatable, replicable, but it's going to work more, right? Like, presumably, you want to do things with people who are more interested in doing them, that kind of thing. But uh, more able, whatever, da 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 da, da have more like a background. Uh, but you can also get the exact sort of like perverse effect. You can because now you can you can also get a situation where the people that you would want aren't going to necessarily want to be in your scheme because if, if, if they're ideal for your scheme, they can probably like, if you're ideal for a villagization scheme as a progressive farmer, you probably are also going to be able to make it on the market yourself and earn more money that way. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Whereas the people that, uh, you, um, that you want would be like dependent on you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The people who are going to want to do it are not necessarily going to do that. So you can get, you can ironically, you can either get a hyper distilled, uh, and therefore successful but non-replicable like miniaturization f- effect, or you can get an adverse selection effect which ends up producing the opposite of the intended. And uh, whether, either way, you're going to, but, but ironically, there are arguments either way to say either or both of those are either successes or failures. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But anyway, that's, now I'm off track, but uh, yeah. That also reminds me of um, Blair Fix uh, from York University did this lecture about um, productivity and he talked about this experiment where um, some like agricultural scientist was trying to create like trying to breed the most productive chicken possible and so he did it initially by selecting for the most individually productive chickens um, but what turned out to happen is uh, as a group they were like the least productive because the only reason they were individually productive is because they were like extremely aggressive and killed other chickens and like stole their eggs. Yeah. They didn't cooperate. Yeah. 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 So to actually create a more productive chicken, he created or he bred the most cooperative. Yeah. Cooperative chickens, which I thought that was really interesting, but yeah, that's, so that's all of the notes I have for this chapter. Um, God, I still haven't learned that I should write a conclusion myself <laughs> for like my overall thoughts on it. There's so much to say, right? Because, like, I mean, in some way, there are a lot of things to talk about. The, the subjects we talked about the most are the ones that connect to thematically to the rest of the book, which, I mean, makes sense. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I think presumably the reason you wanted to be on here is because you wanted me to talk about the way this talks to his other works, right? It's presume, especially yeah. the usage of settlement and legibility, right? I think I sort of touched on that. Um, but like, you know, against the grain, right? It theorizes this at the foundation of the state as such. So it's like uh, uh, the foundation of the state as such required people, land, crops, uh, animals, nature, all the stuff to be totally legible, controllable, and countable and manageable and therefore taxable, accountable, um, and so on. And you also needed to have land controlled and people controlled and social surpluses concentrated in a single area for various reasons. The only way to do that in turn is to have people settle in an area. The only way to people have settled, but if this is not efficient for them, uh, or it's coercive, or it's life sucks, or whatever. People are not just going to settle there, and they're just going to leave. But if people just leave, you can't do the projects. So you need to forcibly settle people, and this mm-hmm. becomes a reinforcing cycle of course of violence, simplification, legibility, creation, um, accounting, uh, violence, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, you can see those processes happening in the modern day in this book, in Against the Grain. But what's key is that they also literally happened in the foundation of the state as such over like thousands of years as well. So it's not like, in fact, they are foundational to the state as such. Right. Because, um, yeah, because that's what you need. You need a legible settled population that can't leave um, or else you can't impose policies on them. You can't tax them. You can't coerce them. You can't coordinate them. You can't uh, have investments and you can't have money and you can't have trade and you can't have, uh, uh, commerce and you can't have central planning and you can't have um commodity production or socialist uh production you can't have factories you can't have all those things right so yeah i thought one of the most ironic things about the chapter on um the soviet union was that um to supposedly build socialism instead of like empowering the proletariat which didn't really exist prior to the revolution they created a proletariat right they had to uh, proletarianize the peasantry yeah and and like we mentioned earlier that's basically what happened in china and what um the pro ccp people are like celebrating as lifting people out of poverty is like the proletarianization of billions of people yeah it's, it's very explicitly it's very explicitly the proletarianization of such and i don't think the chinese government internally is dishonest about that fact. I think right. the MLs are more. I think MLs are more dishonest about it, what the PRC is doing than the PRC is. I don't. Yeah. I, I think I'm pretty sure they are very openly admitting that what they're doing is proletarianization. They just see it as a necessary step for what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Right. I think. I think a lot. I think a lot of the CCP's leaders are true believers, but they're still operating in a state and a capitalist society, and that's that. Right. So. <laughs> um. Right. You know what I mean. Yeah, it doesn't matter what their beliefs are at all, because right, like they still have to adapt them to the actual world they live in, and the world they live in is one of states and capital. So yeah, and that's kind of isn't that kind of like the the culture of the of the Chinese state for like a long time is like that extremely like real politic type of thing. Uh, yeah, but I think all states are like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking of an article I read recently about how like um that state. Uh, like the culture of the um, statesmen existed long before the revolution and the revolution wasn't able to like change that fundamentally. Yeah. But I think that would, if it didn't exist, it would have emerged regardless Mm. because because it's a state. What China has that is sort of unique is a a contiguous historical empire Mm -hmm. held together by an educated scholar Mandarin class. So that's kind of unique. Yeah. And then that didn't go away either. And so that, uh, yeah, so that, that didn't go, and that has definitely persisted into its thing, as well as its diplomatic relations to towers around it and its use of, like, suzerainty as opposed to sovereignty mm-hmm. and uh, d- and divide and rule and uh, and uh, sort of, like, um, if you can't beat them, join them politics, too. But anyway, yeah. Um, oh, there was one other thing I thought of um, with this, which was uh, you... You started reading recently about uh, anti-Jiganism. Mm-hmm. Is that how you pronounce that? Uh, I I actually don't know because I've only ever heard it uh, either mispronounced by Americans or with different <laughs> European ac- different European accents, which pronounce it differently. Gotcha. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That that was something that like this book is making me think of is like 
uh, fundamental to the state. Um, I mean, not necessarily specifically anti jiganism but you know, like uh, prejudice against nomads. Like in in the like in the UK, there's like prejudice against the travelers. Yeah, who are also descent related to the these uh, groups. I actually have several books on these. Uh, huh. <laughs> first, what first what is called the the Jewish Century by uh, Yuri Shleshkin. Uh-huh. Um, and, and his thesis is that uh, I mean, actually, I have it right here. Basically, it's about nomadism, fundamental nomadism, and uh, it's the he uses the figure of Mercury, the nomadic god, as opposed to Apollonius and Dionysus. Mm-hmm. Apollon Dionysus. Uh, and uh, so the first chapter, though, is called um, Mercury Sandals, and it's a comparison of different groups like the overseas Chinese diaspora, um, Jews, Romani, so on. And so the title's, the title's called Memories, uh, first one, Memories, Sandals, the Jews and Other Nomads. Uh, it is very, very interesting. He talks about all these different groups and all of the attempts by the states to control them and, and their fundamental danger they pose to the states' uh, views of the world as such. Um, and then specifically as... Uh, to uh for um the oh yeah and uh, the thesis of this book by Sleshkin coheres a lot with the last chapter of james scott's book against the grain in praise of barbarians Mm -hmm. where it talks about how um the transitionary period of nomads being trying to be controlled by the state and being opposed to the state and then the state co-opting them um and then as particular to the romani example i'm also reading another book called another darkness another dawn which talks about specifically these things and i think it does cite james scott uh in uh in seeing like a state in um to explain uh the way the sort of state's need to control um the figure of this traveler person uh with no nation or community except its own who doesn't obey the rules of the culture and which just wants to wander and doesn't really want to be an agriculturalist or urbanist or bourgeois or be in the feudal system at all or later capitalist system so, like, I don't, I don't know a ton about uh, Jewish history, but does the fact that they were nomads like have a lot to do with like where anti-Semitism came from? The fact that they were um, socially nomadic relative to a society, even if they were settled, is what mm. it has to do with it. So, okay, the idea that yeah, yeah, so like the idea is that they like they don't they they are people of no nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, they aren't in, they aren't integrated into the Christian system or the feudal system or the system of economic production or the system of property ownership or the sultanate or the whatever, mm-hmm. but they are connected to each other and they're constantly being kicked out of places and concentrated in other places. Um, so they develop their own languages and dialects, but and which they use to communicate with each other, but they also learn the local ones. So there's always a dialect of assimilation. So you get a, a culture of people who are connected to each other from all over the world in diverse situations are constantly being kicked out of different places are not integrated into the social whole and social body as such, but, um, are not actually foreign t- are not totally separated from it either. So they are foreign to it, but part of it. And, uh, at the same time, uh, they become fundamental to it, but often, uh, fundamental to it, but also the main targets of eradication when things go wrong. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and this is a self-reinforcing cycle on a social and, ideological and spatial level uh so yeah there's a lot of uh there's a th- between this book the jewish century there's another one called um anti-judaism by uh david nirenberg that uh has a related thesis and basically it has to do with like liminality and uh like people like uh peoples and cultures and ideas that are always on the borders between these two sort of irreconcilable ones and how this this extreme consternation and problems and perceptions of pathology uh, and and desire for control this produces in like the dominant society and in the state and so on. Um, and so the origin of anti-Semitism has a lot to do with that. It's also why Jews historically have graduate gravitated towards things like uh, anarchism. Mm-hmm. But and then as well. This is a side note, but in the Yuri Schleshkin book, he talks about, it's called the Jewish century because he talks about how like the main ideologies that were tied up in this century, it's like liberalism, nationalism, uh, and communism. Those were all like, uh, Jews played like fundamental roles in all three of them, either as targets or creators of them. But, uh, yeah, anyway. Cool. Uh, That's a sort of a side, that's a sort of a side point, but there is a through line connecting uh the state's treatment of romani people mm-hmm. uh the history of anti-semitism uh and the 
state-ish project as such that James Scott discusses. Right. And the Jewish the Jewish question um, arose, uh, and anti-Semitism arose in the context of modernity and capitalism for a lot of reasons that have to do with this James Scott stuff. Uh, Moshe Postone also talks about uh, what he calls structural anti-Semitism as being born from the imminent contradictions of capitalism. Um, I would say that I take his sort of logic, but I combine it with the James Scott and the uh, Yuri Sleshkin, and I argue that the uh, anti-Semitism is born from the like the imminent contradictions of the structural like logic of the state and of the nation as such, mm-hmm. and of and of modernity as such. So uh, yeah, but uh, um, which is as borne out by the fact that like literally every like nationalist and stateist project in Europe from like 1400 to like 1950 was like obsessed with Jews, even if they didn't live, if there, even if there were no Jews in their country. So, uh, hmm. and, like, um, and these were highly tied to modernization and highly tied to nationalism and highly tied to capitalism, highly tied to liberalism, highly tied to the state. Um, the ineradicable but necessary foreigner, uh, no, who is both nomadic and settled, both inside of the society and outside of it, both assimilated and um, non-assimilated, both international and local, both particular and universal both historical and modern you know this kind of like obsession thing it's like you know you can read about it i mean why else do you have like people from england to russia to uh to norway um in these like status projects and these rise of capitalism all become like obsessed with jews and what would later be called the jewish question even if they had never never been jews in that country Mm -hmm. and it's all around the same time too so anyway i actually there is actually a very strong through line between these subjects but that's for that's for that's for the future works of a young neocon when i finally admit my uh, (laughs) name publicly on twitter and uh and uh and uh that's a sort of a research project i'm kind of working on anyway actually at the time and right now but anyway yeah i wonder if there's a similar kind of totem in like east asian countries with with similar characteristics there are several. There are several. Um, uh, outside of China, uh-huh. it's the uh, overseas Chinese diaspora. Okay. Uh, that's one. And then in India and Iran and Pakistan, it's the Parsis. Uh-huh. Um, but remember, there are also, uh, by the way, there are from um, Western Asia to Eastern Asia, there are also Jews there too. <laughs> right, right, right. Who, it's, in many of these cases, were also uh, uh, discussed as such. So, you know, actually what they talk about is like, when there were like anti Chinese campaigns, anti overseas Chinese campaigns in like Indonesia, um, under various reactionary but also socialist parties or whatever, like out of nowhere, despite there being you no know, Jews in Indonesia, all of a sudden anti Semitic tropes came up and were used explicitly to describe the overseas Chinese diaspora. Um, and they were called like the Jews of uh, Asia. And like all of a sudden, like this also would cause anti Semitism, even though there were no like Jews there. And so like, it's another interesting thing because it's, uh, it was a pre-existing idiom that could be used to fashion. So it's like, why have to, why reinvent the wheel when this idiom for describing these people that you consider foreign and don't like already exists for like these uh, status projects. So it's another interesting thing, but yeah. Um, I also just thought of, there is a, uh, this fringe theory that, uh, the Japanese people were, the main part of the 10 lost tribes of Israel. That's pretty funny. From the 16th century, I think. Um, I, I think, I think it said it was a Dutch person, which makes sense, perfect sense, you know, <laughs> um, that came up with it. That'd be pretty funny. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we, we talked about it on a, on a past episode, but, um, anyway, do you want to say, do you want to send me something on that? I'd love to read about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that's about all I have. Yeah. I think uh, it's been a good two hours, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so young Neocon, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, it was great to have you back. Yeah. See you soon. Um, I'll try to, if you want me to send any like links or anything, I'll do that. Okay. Although this time, this time I didn't think I had like, uh, I don't think I gave a massive list of things except maybe a couple of books at the end. Yeah. I wrote down, uh, those last two books you mentioned. So, yeah. um, I got those. Anything you want to plug while you're on here? Um, no, I'm good, but thank you. Yeah. Okay. Check out check out his Twitter at Young Neocon. Or uh, or or don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. I'll see you later. All right. Bye. 
If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our other episodes on every podcast platform, including Spotify and YouTube. We would love it if you left a nice review on iTunes, which helps people get the show in their recommendations or tell your friends if you're cool enough to have those. We have a low-key merch shop at Teespring with some cool shirt designs. I know it's not really good to use them, but until there is significant interest in merch, it would be pretty impractical to do a run of merch from a proper printer. So if people are interested, let us know. You can follow us on Twitter at NeighborsciPod. If you want to support the show and help pay our producer, we have a Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Neighbor Science. Our producer for some of our episodes is Casino Socks. You can check out his music at soundcloud.com slash casino socks. And finally, you can check out our website, neighborsciencepodcast.com, which has tags on all our episodes. So if you're looking for a particular subject, it's much easier to find on there than just scrolling through the entire list of episodes in your podcast app. And thanks again for listening. Say-